I'm going to do the update in cerebral protection devices. Here is my disclosure. The outcome after carotid artery stenting is related to multiple factors. Age of the patient, the presence of symptoms, aortic arch anatomy, plaque morphology, cerebral function reserve, experience of the operator, and probably the type of cerebral protection device that we use. And as a reminder, the goal of cerebral protection devices is to prevent or minimize embolization to the brain during the procedure. And there are different ways to protect the brain during carotid artery stenting from macro and microembolization point of view. We can stop the flow at the level of the internal carotid artery, and we can do that with the original Theron technique, which consists in placing a balloon distal to the lesion. Similar technology is the Percusers, but more, uh, more sophisticated technology. But we are not using that uh, anymore. Then the most popular form is the use of a filter. And there are multiple filters in the uh, market available. And then we have what we call proximal occlusion. And that proximal occlusion can be done in three different ways with flow reversal, without flow reversal, with a device that is named MoMA. And then a more recent technology is what we call cervical flow reversal. Every time we use one of these devices, with all of them, we can collect particles. When you see on the upper left corner of the slide, it's a filter that has particles that came during carotid artery stenting on a patient. What you see on the right is the product of filtrating the filtration of the blood after using a distal occlusion balloon. You see the particles there. And in the bottom is the filter with many particles that stop there by using flow reversal uh, to do a carotid artery stenting. So let's go to review the filters. As you can see here, there are different filters, and they look different. They have different landing zones requirement. You see that there are ones that they need more real estate to, to be placed distal to the lesion. Some are shorter. That's an important feature when it's time to select one of them. The material that is, uh, is produced, these filters, varies also. The size of the pores, you can see that there are some that have 100 microns. That's the most popular size of the pores. But there are one, like the spider uh, filter, that has almost three times the size of the pores. So that means that that filter may not protect the brain as well as the other ones with smaller uh, pore size. And also, when you look at the uh, way the distal aspect of the filter and the transition with the wire, you see that there are ones like the gore that is smoother. And then you have another one uh, more to the right where there is a, a, a step. And that step, when you cross a lesion that is very tight, you can push particles to the brain just when you are crossing the lesion. So the filters have advantages. Uh, one of the advantages is that they are very easy to use. It's something that you use over uh, an 014 wire, and it's, it's very simple. It's very intuitive. Uh, you, there is preservation of the flow, and you can do angiograms during the procedure. However, there are some disadvantages. As I mentioned before, no, there is no protection when you cross the lesion with the filter, and therefore, you can be pushing particles to the brain, and the patient can have a stroke just by crossing the lesion. And because of the presence of pores, you can be missing small size particles. Everything that is below 100 micron 
pores can go through, uh, through the pores and go to the brain. And the filter can get occluded by thrombus, uh, sometimes because the, uh, the filter is attached to the wire uh, that is in front of them, may be difficult to cross tight lesions or whenever the lesion is in a tortuous anatomy. And of course, because we are placing the filter in the internal carotid artery, there is a risk of spasm or dissection at that level. And as Mark Woolley showed yesterday, not all the filters, not only they don't look the same, but they don't function the same. So that's why we, we just to just to be more graphic, when we compare things, we not only want to compare uh, apples with apples, but even among apples, you have red apples and you have uh, green apples. So remember, not all the filters work in this work in the same way. There are ones that are more efficient than other ones. In terms of what happened. Uh, every time we use a filter, we know that some patients don't develop a stroke clinically evident, but some, due to the embolization of microparticles, can develop what we call silent infarcts. And those silent infarcts are only seen when we do diffusion weighted MRI studies. And we know that when patients go and have a carotid endarterectomy, the number of patients that have these new lesions is 10%. But if you use a filter, you can go up to 37%. That's one other thing that is not that good when we're doing carotid artery stenting, the presence of microembolization. And that microembolization is higher when we use filters. So in general, again, in order to be graphic, we can tell that filters are great but the filters are pretty much like a fish net. They are good to trap fish that are large, so we can uh, be sure that they will trap big particles, but probably the small particles can go through that filter. Let's go now and see uh, what's going on with proximal uh, balloon occlusion. Again, as I mentioned before, there are different technologies. This is the MoMA device. As you can see, there is a balloon that is placed in the external carotid artery that is connected to the guiding catheter that has another balloon that is used to occlude the antegrade flow in the common carotid artery. And then there is a working channel at the end of the large balloon there that allows you to do the procedure. So by inflating both the proximal and the distal balloon, there is flow stagnation and then there is no way that a particle can go to the brain. And what you can do here, and these are the pros, when you cross the lesion, you already have this, the protection system in place. You don't start to interact with the plaque until that is in place. Therefore, there is no way that the particle can go to the brain when, when you cross it. Of course, we can treat tortuous distal uh, internal carotid arteries. We can interact in, in, in lesions that are more, more complex, you know, like we see in patients that are symptomatic, in which there are thrombi, thrombus uh, as part of the lesion. And what uh, you obtain here is what we call flow stagnation. So there is a column of blood that is standing there and is not moving north, but in theory, it's not, it's not being aspirated as well, unless, unless you do it in, a, in an active way, which is something that most of the people are doing. And then we used to have this technology, which is the uh, proximal protection with uh, flow reversal. What did I do there? Can you go back? Do we have a laser pointer here? Which one? The lower? It's at the top. Ah, in the top. OK. OK. So going back, this uh, flow reversal system, again, has a guiding catheter that is placed at the common carotid artery, a 
balloon on a wire that goes to the external carotid artery. And then the proximal aspect of this sheath is connected through a venous sheath with a filter in between, creating an external arteriovenous fistula. And that increases the amount of blood that comes from the arterial system to the venous system. And therefore, there is more blood that is coming in a retrograde fashion from the brain through the plaque. So any particle that gets dislodged during crossing the lesion or manipulation of the plaque itself during balloon predilation or placement of the stent or post dilation, instead of going north to the brain, is going to go out through the guiding sheath and be stopped by the filter that's in between the arterial and the venous uh, side. So the advantages of this technology, again, you obtain complete protection before you manipulate the uh, lesion. There is no way that you can have embolization through the internal or the external carotid artery. And you stop every particle, regarding the size of the particle. We, you don't depend on, on, on the porous that you, you do when you use a filter. And you can treat lesions using your wire of choice. Uh, and therefore, before, because you don't have a balloon or a filter in the internal carotid artery, you avoid the potential lesion at the, the, of the internal carotid artery or even the spasm at that level. There are some disadvantages. Of course, we are stopping the flow during protection, and some patients do not tolerate. The number of patients that do not tolerate is low, but some do not tolerate the procedure. Now, because you have a balloon in the common carotid artery, you can produce a dissection or spasm at the level of the external or the common carotid artery. And you need a larger size. The cases that are done with the filter are done with a six French sheath. This one is a nine French sheath. So the entry in the groin is larger. And of course, as I mentioned before, you need to have a sheath in the femoral vein. So it's one more step than the one that you use uh, when you do a case with a filter. And in terms of the size of the, of the sheath in the femoral artery, a six French makes a hole of 2.6 millimeters in the artery. And the gore flow reversal used to make a hole that it was 3.17. So some people think that this is, you know, this is, it's okay to go bigger if you're going to be safer in terms of how much you're going to protect the brain. And we did a study at uh, the Medical University of South Carolina comparing how much microembolization goes to the brain using filters and using flow reversal. And the way we detect those microembolizations was by using transcranial Doppler. As you can see here, when we use a filter, the number of particles was high, 102. And this was not actually, these are not particles, but they are what we call hits, which may represent, most likely, the, the the events of embolization. Uh, and you see the difference when we use filters compared to flow reversal, mainly in the phase two of the procedure, which is the one that is more embolygenic. You see 294 against six hits when you use flow reversal. So flow reversal, in one way or the other one, matches the protection strategies of the carotid endarterectomy but in an endovascular tool by establishing protection prior to crossing the lesion, you include a shunt and you flush the lesion with flow reversal before you reestablish antegrade flow. And this is why we believe that this is good technology. And there is a paper here which is a meta-analysis of the result of six independent studies done with proximal, rever uh, with proximal protection. Those include both the MoMA and the gore flow reversal. And as you can see here, the rate in those, all those cases, 2,397 patients, stroke 1.7%, acute myocardial infarction 0.2, death 0.4. So the composite 30 days is 2.2. Five. So if we look back at the results of CREST, where the results shows that the incidence of stroke at 30 days was double 
compared to carotid endarterectomy. And now we put, and, and those cases were done with filters, actually with first generation, first generation filters. And now we put the results of this trial done with proximal protection, you see how the numbers start to look much better for carotid artery stenting compared to surgery. So how do we best achieve flow reversal, which is something that we, we, we believe? Uh, you may know, know, but this technology is not longer available in the market. The company decided to take it off uh, for reasons that are, have nothing to do with the, uh, with the efficiency of the device, but mainly because it was cumbersome for them to, to produce it, and then there is a reduction in the uh, number of procedures uh, that are done. Carotid artery stenting is, is not used as frequently as was expected um, for multiple reasons, and uh, therefore uh, they decided to take this device out of the market. So we don't have that possibility to use that device, but we still have the MoMA, and now we have the cervical uh, protection. So be, before, because we don't have gore flow reversal, what we can do is use the MoMA, and we can use as it is, and using uh, aspiration uh, in order to simulate or to, to create uh, flow reversal, or we can either connect a filter like uh, with a flow reversal to a vein, and we are, we are just having something similar to the gore flow reversal, or we can put a bag where we are collecting the blood here, so we can get, we can get that uh, uh, flow reversal to be effective. But the, 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 the new technology is something that uh, uh, started to be used uh, many, many years ago. Uh, and actually, the original idea uh, came from uh, somebody that trained with, uh, with Frank Vith. Um, and consist on the uh, fact that in order to avoid all the problems at the level of the thoracic aorta, which is the source of uh, complications during carotid artery stenting, especially in patients with tortuous anatomy, you access the carotid artery in the lower aspect of the neck with a small incision and then you place a sheath at that level, which is a short sheath, and you connect that sheath with another one in the venous side on the groin of the patient, and you have a high flow connection between both of them, and by using that, you don't need to occlude the external carotid artery, and when you open to high flow, you have flow reversal. So through the working channel of that system, that sheath in the neck, you can go ahead and do the carotid stenting with uh, this type of protection. So some people may ask, so if you're gonna do an incision in the neck, why don't you go ahead and just do a carotid endarterectomy? Well, it's a different level of dissection. First of all, uh, you know, carotid uh, endarterectomy requires a, a, a different type of access, you need to get to the plaque, you start to manipulate the plaque. Uh, here is a small incision in the common carotid artery with the, uh, the plaque is, uh, the artery is disease free. Uh, you can do it under local anesthesia. Of course, you can do carotid endarterectomy also under local anesthesia. Uh, but the idea also is to prevent um, complications um, by manipulating the um, cranial nerves that is something that could happen during, uh, during carotid endarterectomy. So those are the images. Uh, there is a study that has been completed in the United States after a study that was completed in Europe. It's the Roaster study. Interesting, the two principal investigators of this study are two vascular surgeons, uh, some of them uh, that were against carotid artery stenting by femoral root, now 
these people are starting, starting to buy into this less invasive way, but by accessing the carotid at the level of the neck. The study includes 208 patients in 18 sites, and of course they were uh, high surgical risk, symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. Um, and uh, the primary endpoint are similar to other studies, and secondary endpoints include uh, the incidence of cranial nerve injury, uh, which is important. As you can see, uh, patients with uh, serious problems like hostile necks were included in the study and uh, were excluded patients that had uh, disease at the common carotid artery, where you need to access, of course, or where uh, the lesion uh, was, um, the, the, the bifurcation was too low. The age of the patients, as you can see, 47% uh, were older than 70, uh, 75, and 28% were older than 80. Uh, again, patients with hostile neck, 16%, risk stenosis, post-carotid arterectomy is also important. And the time uh, that took to do uh, during uh, which they had flow reversal was 10 minutes and high flow reversal was nine minutes. And look at the numbers. Major stroke, zero. Minor stroke, two cases. Uh, and then stroke and death, 2.8%. 2, 2 and those uh, deaths were not related cases, no, not related to the procedure. So these are very good results. And um, as you can see here, no major stroke, no minor stroke. Uh, this is uh, important, important um, progress uh, in, in, in the uh, results for carotid artery stenting. Of course, those cases were done from a cervical approach. Uh, so in conclusions, clinical trials with filters and proximal protection devices show clinical results which are within the accepted American Heart Association standards but they don't, we don't see, in clinically speaking, a big difference between filters and, and proximal protection as we expected. Um, however, transcranial Doppler and diffusion weighted MRI show significant reduction of microembolization when you use proximal protection. And there is a group of patients that benefits from the use of proximal protection, which are the, the symptomatic and the patients uh, which are octogenarians. So uh, with this, I finish this part of the lecture, my first lecture. I'm going to go and move right away to the second one.